uh, the Lord's Supper, uh, a study that I've done. And, um, and I had prepared it a few days ago, was ready with it. And then this morning, you know, it just started, things started going through my mind. And, and I, I don't know, um, you know, things I find interesting, sometimes I get here and they're not that interesting to you. <laughs> um, but I was all excited about this and uh, I hope you get a blessing out of it. Um, you know, it, but we're going to be talking about the ordinances of the church. And kind of, you know, when you think about the Lord's Supper, and, and I'll tell you what they two are, the Lord's Supper is one of them, and believer's baptism, which is a water baptism, is the other ordinance. There are only two ordinances given to the church to observe, and those are the two. Have you ever just wondered how kind of a mystery they are, you know, why, you know? Yet in the Old Testament, you've got, I mean, you've got ordinances galore about everything you can imagine. I mean, you've got new moons, you've got Sabbaths, you've got feasts, uh, you've got uh, uh, sacrifices, you've got a priesthood, and all the ordinances go with it. There's so many. And yet, we come down to church, you only got two. And then, after the church is gone, and well, let's just say after the tribulation's over with, guess what? A good portion of all those ordinances come right back. And you wonder why. Why do they need to come back? Um, so the first question I'd like to answer is, what happened to all the ordinances of the past? Because we'll say, oh, that's all been done away. Well, then I can read Ezekiel. If you read Ezekiel, they're all back. A good portion of them are. And hopefully I can explain that. Or give you an explanation. I don't know whether it'll be the correct one, but I'm going to give you one. Amen. You can decide whether it's correct or not. But turn to Hebrews chapter 9. And the first thing you need to realize is that everything back there, that Old Testament, are figures, pictures, types, examples, and shadows of things to come. We've talked about this many times that you could almost say that the Old Testament is a parable of the new. There are parallel truths, but it's not the real thing. He said the blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sin. So what was all that in the Old Testament? Well, it was figures, pictures, and types, and shadows of something in the future. The funny thing is, is why is it all coming back? Even the animal sacrifices are back in the millennium. Well, we'll see. Hebrews chapter 9. Let's first, let's talk about the past. Uh, Hebrews chapter 9, starting at verse 1. He says, Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a world sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle made, the first, wherein was the candlestick, talk about the first compartment of it, wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer of the Ark of the Covenant overlay round about with gold, wherein was golden pot, was the golden pot that had manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant. That's the two stones with the Ten Commandments on it. And over it the cherubims of glory, shadowing the mercy seat, of which we cannot now speak particularly. Now these weren't real cherubims, they were sculptures of cherubim. Okay. Now when these things were thus ordained, the priest went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But into the second with the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the heirs of the people. The Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet, uh, yet made manifest, well, as the first tabernacle was yet standing. What they found out is that veil, that veil told you something's wrong. We do, we do not have access to God. Only one man does, and he's a high priest, and guess what? Who's who he's going to picture? Okay, we do not have access to God until that veil is up ready. Well, what's the veil likened to in the book of Hebrews? What's the veil likened to? His flesh. Listen, when they, that, when they rent his flesh and he gives up that ghost, that, that veil, that temple, rents in half. And there's something to that, man, where God is releasing what is in Jesus Christ. The most precious fluid in the universe is coming out. And it is it, is, it literally... It is literally in every corner of God's creation. And it is that thing that is always there because it's supernatural. 
Just as, just as God is eternal, that blood is eternal because that was God's blood. Now whether part of it, uh, the human part of it, or the, the physical part of it dried up at the base of the cross, I don't know. All I'm telling you is that blood, there's a reason why the great deep is likened to the Red Sea. Because even the blood is there. And that's the reason why the blood, the blood, why? Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. God not only had to redeem us, He had to redeem the creation. And that blood's everywhere. So you have figures and types and pictures of something that hasn't happened yet, but it's going to. And then look what he says in verse 9. He tells you, we're talking about the first tabernacle, which was a figure for the time then present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the, the service perfect. It couldn't save him. Yet he's doing them. As pertaining to the conscience, which stood only in meats and drinks and divers washings, uh, and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of Reformation. They're doing these ordinances, and they're not the real thing. They're, they're pictures and types of the real thing that's coming. That's going to be important when it comes around to us. Now this is easily seen. Okay, let me give you an idea. The feast, the fast, the new moons... The sanctuary, the temple, the tabernacle, the service, the Sabbath, the sacrifices, and even the priesthood are all pictures, pictures and shadows of things to come. That entire Old Testament. The blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sin. All the sacrifices back there couldn't take away one sin. They did it because God told them to do it, and God said, just do it, that, do it that way right, right now. That's just like a plastic credit card. I'm going to pay later. That's really what it was. Because you do know you've got to pay off some credit cards now, right? December is nearly over. Guess what? The bill's coming. It's easy to whip out that plastic, you know, here, 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 and buy everything you want, and then the bill comes due. You end up paying so much more for what you bought on credit, you could probably buy 10 of them for the price you end up paying for it if you don't pay that credit card off. And if you don't know that yet, you will. <laughs> um, so, let's look at the three main feasts and what they picture. And I turn to Hebrews eleven nineteen because we'll talk about the first one here, Passover. Of course, Passover, uh, that originated with the Passover lamb in, in Exodus chapter 12. If you ever read that chapter, you can see the crucifixion of Jesus Christ all through the chapter. The fact that it is a male lamb of the first year and no blemish, blood on the post where it can not only represent three crosses of where, the, of where that blood is, but it can represent a cross itself from where it's positionally put on those side posts and the, and the, top, of the, uh, the top of the door. Um, you have the fact that it's roasted with fire, picturing, picturing his suffering. Okay? The uh, he said, I thirst. There, there's just so many things about it. Uh, the fact that it's mixed with bitter herbs in, in the gospel is a bitter message. It's telling people you're on your way to hell. It's a bitter message. Um, anyway, those are, those are figures. But anyway, so you have the Passover. Hebrews eleven nineteen says, um, is that what I want? No, I'm in the wrong chapter. No wonder it ain't what I want. It says, the county that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. Well, that was Isaac. Talk about Abraham and Isaac. Now, he didn't end up offering Isaac, but as far as God was concerned, the figure was still there. He was willing to. He was willing to offer up his only son. And he's even offering him on the same mountain, okay? Mount Moriah, where the temple is, where the blood is applied to the altar. I mean, it's the same place. But you see, it was done in type. And so the Passover pictures the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. God did that thing on Passover. And then on Pentecost, it pictures the church's beginning. You know, the, 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 it, Pentecost is like that, that one feast you're kind of looking at and you go, huh? Because it is the only feast that has leaven in it. The bread was to be... What, what's leaven a type of in the Bible? Sin and false doctrine. Yet, Pentecost has leaven in it. And guess what was leavened from the very beginning? 
the church. They are dealing with, I mean, just ask the Apostle Paul. Read 1 Corinthians. What's he dealing with? He's dealing with sin and false doctrine. Leaven. And, and the uh, Feast of Pentecost has leaven in it. It is where the church, I'm not going to say it's the, it is, the, it is when the church begins as far as people are in it. Actually, that's prepared at the cross, but Pentecost is when it begins because that's when the Holy Spirit begins His ministry. Nobody is born again until that day because it's the Spirit of God that gives you the new birth. Okay? Um, also, that Pentecost, because it's springtime, May, June, it's going to picture the church began at Pentecost. It'll probably end at Pentecost. Why? God's doing things according to these feasts. Why? They're, they're ordinances that tell of something in the future. He's helping you out. Um, tabernacles. The Feast of Tabernacles pictures both Advents, first and second. It's God tabernacling in the flesh. And then coming back. Okay? Him coming back. So the Tabernacles, and that's the time frame of the second Advent, is the time of Tabernacles. You could have the rapture, and when we talked about this in Daniel 70 weeks, and 6.38 years or 2,300 day, days later, you're going to fall on Tabernacles. So it's important you see that these, these are pictures. Okay? Now, instead of me talking about now, I'm going to jump past the past, in the pre I'm going to jump past the present, oh, that's hard, into the future. If that don't make any sense, just... <laughs> all right? And that, the question is this, if all these types were fulfilled, why are they all back in the future millennium? Well, that's a good question, cause you, and you'll know this when you're reading through, you'll get to Ezekiel chapter 40. And he's talking about the sanctuary, and he's talking about, I mean, he's talking about the sacrifices. He's and you're like... Why are these back? They can't take away sin. Why are they back? Because the, 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 the one that they pictured showed up and the Lamb of God took away the sins of the world. How, how, why are they back? That's a good question. Now, I think I've got an answer for that. I, I think I do. Not only are ordinances a shadow of things to come, but they're also a memorial of the past. If you think about it, both the ordinances given to us, one of them is an absolute memorial of the past, is it not? And it's an ordinance. Is it the real thing? No! But it is a representation of the real thing as a memorial. The other one is, even water baptism is a memorial of what's already happened. Is it not? Okay. Kind of interesting. So it goes both ways. Not only could it, the ordinances picture something in the future in type and in picture and a shadow of things to come, but it could also go back the other way as a memorial. Now, neither Israel or the nations have any clue what the Old Testament pictured in type. Do you realize that? For 2,000 years. Well, actually, for about 4,000 <laughs> I mean, if you want to talk about Israel not knowing what's, what the pictures and types... I mean, they, they have great understanding of their Old Testament. They really do. But when it comes to what they picture, they're lost. That's the reason why they didn't see who was before them. Their Messiah was right before them because somehow they missed it. They embraced the religion of those things and forgot about the pictures and types of those things. And what it, a shadow of things to come. And... When their Messiah shows up, they don't even recognize him. And everything back there in the Old Testament is a picture and type of him. So, the nations don't have any clue either. Well, guess what they get? They get a thousand years to figure it out. A thousand years. What you're going to find out, this isn't about, this isn't about individuals, it's about nations. And the nations are going to know what those feasts are about, those new moons, those Sabbaths, everything, and especially the Feast of Tabernacles. Because they do have, that is a global, that is a global, national, not global, it's a global holiday, holy day. And they have to participate in that. All the nations do. Turn to Exodus chapter 19 and we'll give you another reason why 
God goes backwards and brings all those ordinances forward to where they're keeping Sabbaths and new moons and all that good stuff and sacrifices. Because you know how I know this? Because we already have it in picture and type before. All we have to do is move it forward and you can see it. Uh, Exodus 19, verse 5 and 6, it says, Now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. Okay? Now think about the millennium. All the earth is his. And look what he says. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. I got to thinking about that. I said, a whole kingdom of priests. Well, let's think back for a second. Twelve tribes. With one tribe who's not numbered with the twelve. And who's that? Levi. Levi's not numbered with the twelve. Levi is the priest tribe. What are the responsibility of the twelve tribes? What are, they, what are they responsible for? They have to feed Levi. Levi partakes of the sacrifices. Do you know what you have in the millennium? You have one nation that will not be numbered with the other 12. But you know what those nations will be responsible to do? Feed that kingdom of priests. Their sacrifices are what feeds. It was the sacrifices that fed the Levites, and it's going to be the sacrifices of the nations, the heave offerings, the wave offerings, the peace offerings. It's those things that they're going to bring in that's going to feed that kingdom of priests called Jews. Go take care of all of them. And God is going to use that old system, and he's going to use it because he's just going to move it forward in the future. Why? Everything will be a remembrance. Everything will be um, a memorial. Because they've never acknowledged it. Well, not even the Jews have. It's going to be a learning experience for all of them. Here we are in the church age, a bunch of Gentiles. And we see all these pictures in Titus, man. We're just going nuts. The nations don't see it. The Jews don't see it. They will in the millennium. And they'll have a thousand years to practice that. And now I believe that's the reason why they're, uh, they are, you find that in the millennium because there are going to be 12 nations. And the 13th, which is not numbered with them, they are not numbered, is Israel. In, it, it, within the, the, the boundaries that God has set for them and the land boundary, which is quite large, and all the nations will flow into it. And they're going to sustain Israel throughout for a thousand years. Because they're going to be bringing... Because it says when they come for the feast... Let me show you... Um, uh, Zechariah 14.6. Zechariah 14, verse 6. And that ain't it. Uh, I got it wrong. Um, I think it's... Yeah. 16, that's why, right. okay, I've got it off. Thank you, Keith. It shall come to pass that everyone that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the king. So the king's here. And the Lord of hosts, and to keep the feast of tabernacles. And it shall be that whosoever will not come up of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, even upon them shall be no rain. Then he talks about if they don't come up, he'll smite them with a plague in verse 18. But all the families of the earth are going to come up. So whereas you have one tribe that was a uh, tribe of priests, now you have a whole kingdom of them, a whole nation of priests. Why? They, you're going to need, the, the, the nations are going to need, we're not going to need the Jew. The nations, the Gentiles are going to need the Jew to access to the king. That's how important that Jew will be. Okay. Now let's move to the present. You say, why, why only two? Why only two ordinances? Of all the things, the Sabbaths and all that stuff, you know, the feast, why only two? Because we got the real deal. We got the real deal. 
Uh, we didn't get pictures, types, figures, or shadows. We got the real thing, man. All the way down the line, the things that, that happened to us, the things that God did to us are real, tangible, uh, spiritual, but they, but they happen. They're not, they're not something, a picture of anything. We got the real deal. And that's the reason why we only have two ordinances. Because there's no reason for us to have shadows and pictures of things except for the things that really relate to us. And that's exactly what these two ordinances do. They relate to us. Um, think about this. We got the new birth, the baptism of the Holy Ghost into the body of Christ, sealed by the Spirit of God to the day of redemption, seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, operated on without hands and cutting away the body of the sins of the flesh, Colossians chapter 2. We don't have need for pictures, types, or figures. I mean, everything that God, ha uh, everything that God had for us, He did for us. We're not picturing anything in the future. We're it, man. We got it. We got more than what you, you can't even imagine. You know, a truth that prevailed, or a truth that, um, prevailed upon me, I guess, is the fact that I have eternal life right now. I've already been given it. I was given it 45 years ago, 46 years ago. I received the free gift of eternal life. Find anyone else in your Bible that has eternal life outside of someone in, in, in the church age. So find me someone in the Old Testament that says they have eternal life. Find me someone in the tribulation that says they have eternal life. Even if they're offered, even if they sacrifice their life, they're a martyr. Find anyone in the millennium that could say they have eternal life. According to what I read, until they partake of the tree of life, they do not have eternal life. They may be uh, promised it. They may be um, told that they're going to receive it, but they haven't got it until they partake of the tree of life. You know, that's what it says, that they, that they may have right. They keep the commandments that they may have right to the tree of life. And you have a works and faith salvation going on in the Old Testament. You've got it in the tribulation, and you've got nothing but works in the millennium for salvation. Only in this age do you get... See, Dr. Ruckman put it this way. They have to go to the tree of life to get eternal life, just like Adam and Eve would have had to go to the tree of life to get eternal life. You and I went to the tree of death. We went to the cross and got eternal life. Jesus Christ is our tree of life. Okay? But we're the only ones that can boast that that I can see in the entire Bible. Because all those have to be resurrected go into New Jerusalem and partake of the tree. We do not. We have it now. Even, even though we're in mortal flesh, we have eternal life. So we've got the goods. Uh, look in Colossians chapter 2. And another reason is because there's, there's a good reason why we don't have all these ordinances we have to uh, maintain and keep. Colossians chapter 2, look at verse 14. It says, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. <laughs> Pictures and types. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. You know how he did that? He kept them. He kept all the ordinances. Look what it has to say. Having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink because there's a lot of ordinances about that, or in respect of a holy day, or of a new moon, or of the Sabbath days. Why? Which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. You're in Him. He's in you. He kept it. It's out of our way, man. I mean, why keep it when He already kept it? No, why, keep, why try to keep it <laughs> when He kept it? That's the reason why we don't have it. We've only got two. I think that's a great deal. So only two ordinances are given for the church to observe. And I'm going to go through them quickly. And what they picture. Some of the things I probably missed. I'm sure I've missed a whole bunch of things that could be applied to this. Uh, baptism by immersion. Okay? It's a picture, a type, a figure, but it's not the real thing. 
Even 1 Peter 3.21 tells you that. The like figure wherein to even baptism doth also now save us, take out the parentheses for a second, by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The like figure of what happened to Noah, okay, that saved them, but that's the, that's the like figure. The like figure is never the real thing. If I have a photograph of you and I say, look, you know, here's a photograph of Ben. You say, well, I, I, if I say, well, this is Ben. You say, no, that's Ben. That's a, that's a like figure of Ben. That's a picture of Ben. Okay? And he's telling you it's the, uh, uh, th that it's a like figure, but it's not the real thing. So, Here's some, here's some things that water baptism or believer's baptism is going to picture. Number one, Christ was baptized. Now, it couldn't have meant the same thing for him that it means for us today. Because he wasn't a sinner, was he? Yet he was baptized. Hmm. But if I do understand, did he did come down through water, didn't he? To become a fisher of men? I mean, if anything, I mean, because baptism pictures more than what it just does just for us. You understand that. So for him, it was a picture of him coming down through the water. To her, to men, to be a fisher of men. Because he talked about his disciples. He said, I'll make you fishers of men. We're under the water. The Jews were baptized. And that one was different too. Because our Bible tells us in John, the Gospel of John, that the baptism was to manifest the Messiah to Israel. And it was a baptism of repentance. Well, Christians already know who Christ is. I already know He's the Messiah. I don't need Him manifest to me through baptism. I knew it before I got baptized. Okay? And it wasn't a matter of uh, th this being a... Uh, um, cleansing agent like it's mentioned in John chapter 3. Um, oh, how does that go? The word's going to escape me. Concerning Okay, let me go there real quick. John chapter 3 Uh Now I won't be able to find it. Ah, hold it. He's talked about in verse 23, and John also was baptizing in Anon near to Salim um, because there was much water there, and they came and were baptized, for John was not cast into prison yet, or cast into prison. Then there arose a question between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purifying. Well, water baptism is not about purifying to us. It's about the death, burial, and resurrection. But to a Jew, it's about purifying. That's the reason why he said, get in the water. Acts meet for, uh, he said, bring forth therefore fruits, meet for repentance. The fruit meet for repentance is for the Pharisees and them to get in the water. Why? If you got in the water, you're saying, I'm unclean and I need to be purified. And everybody knows, I mean, I hope you clean with, you all wash your dishes with water. It's a purifying agent. It just is. Now, it doesn't do anything for you spiritually, but it does picture something physically. If you say, well, I haven't had a bath in three weeks, please sit on the other side of the room. Um, anyway, something came to mind. I got, I got my nose blown right out of my head <laughs> being close to somebody. Anyway, moving on. Um, I went in close. I went in close to hear something that I shouldn't have went in close, and I got a blast in my nostrils that stayed with me for three days. And I and I and I, and I lost a good portion of my smelling from to COVID. Okay. Um, got a bad. <laughs> no, no. I mean, it was it was so bad that even it, it. You know, I think it could have overwhelmed a corpse myself. I mean, it would have made the corpse stand up. And, but I mean, anyway, that's what happens, you know. Anyway, <clears throat> now I'm off my one. Okay, so the Jews were baptized. Think about this. If it, if it pictures something, do you realize the Gentiles, the Gentiles submit to a baptism that the Jews rejected? 
Even though it may not be the same type or picture, we submit to a, a baptism. They don't, and we remind them of it every time it happens. Not only does it, where well, the Jews baptize, the manifest the Messiah to Israel, and pictures the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And every believer in this age. When you, when you stand in that baptismal pool, you're stating more than just, you know, I'm in the water because I'm in church. That, that's got really nothing to do with it. You're saying, I've repented, I've changed my mind. I was dead in trespasses and sins, buried in the likeness of his death, raised in newness of life. You pictures a resurrection. Going under the water pictures your death. And spiritually, the Bible says you're dead and your life is hid in Christ. All these are just pictures and types, but you're actually telling the world, I was dead in trespasses and sins. Then I was buried in the likeness of death, raised in newness of life. And we're going to find out that there's even something about that where when Jesus Christ is hanging on that cross, when you believed on Him, you were hanging there with Him. And when He went down to the grave, so did you. And He went down in the, the earth, so did you. You were buried with Him. You say, how could that be? Somehow it's a transference. It's like you were there. As far as God was concerned, you were there. And you're stating that. All that by standing in that water, going under, coming back up. Not only are you saying, I believe in His resurrection, because obviously, doesn't the Bible say they were baptized for the dead over there in 1 Corinthians 15? Well, that's exactly what he's talking about. Baptism is a picture of death, but coming out of the water is a picture of coming back to life. And why would you submit to that baptism if you don't believe in the resurrection? That's the whole argument in 1 Corinthians 15 is the resurrection. The Bible says we're of all men most miserable if, it doesn't, if, it does, if it's not true. In fact, we're fools. <laughs> so it pictures the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and every believer. It pictures a future bodily resurrection. When you... Submit to believer's baptism. You're saying, I'm coming up. If I go down in the ground, I'm coming up. That's what you're saying. Uh, I mentioned that baptism of the death. Romans chapter 6, and there's no water in that passage at all in that chapter. You go read Romans chapter 6, and it's saying you're there. That's the transference I was talking about. The baptism unto death. Then there's the baptism of suffering. Christ talked about that baptism. Well... You know, he said to his disciples, he said, you indeed will be baptized with the baptism where am I baptized with. Now, his baptism was a little different. But he said, you're going to suffer too. And you know what the Bible says about that? You're going to suffer too. If you're obedient to God, all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And then there's the promise of eternal life. You know why? They didn't dunk you twice. Now, if you went to one of them churches and dunk you forward three times or ten times backwards, they got it all wrong, man. Now, it does say it's appointed a man wants to die, and after this, the judgment, and then can come the second death for those that aren't saved. But me, the most I can die is once. Once. Now, there are some individuals that are exceptions to the rule, but they are the exception to the rule. The rule is, you're only going to die, if you're saved, you're only going to die once. And... Hopefully, we won't even have that one. Like I said, there's exceptions to the rule, but the rule for the last two millennium has been what? One death. Paul had a couple. He said, in deaths, oft. But he's the exception to the rule. Okay, now let's talk about the Lord's Supper, and then we're going we're gonna to have the Lord's Supper. Uh, it is a picture. It's a type, figure, but it's not the real thing. It connects both advents. Because one is talking about um, the cross, his first coming, the bread of life being offered. Um, and then it says we, we do this, um, how's it put it? Show the Lord's death till he come. Never hear a Roman Catholic say that. Never hear a Pope ever talk about the second advent of Jesus Christ, the second coming. Yet, when we have the Lord's Supper, it is a promise that he's coming back. Okay? Okay. So it pictures the crucifixion, the bread of life is being offered. Now here's something, the salvation of the sinner, it pictures the salvation of the sinner receiving the sacrifice. And he even talks about it in these terms. I don't know if you realize it or not, but you know, you're, you put that bread in your mouth, that unleavened bread, it pictures Christ. And you eat it. Okay? And that 
new wine that's in that cup, it's unleavened, because if it's hooch, it ain't, it, it's not the right stuff. It's unleavened. You partake of that. That picture's his blood. And guess what? You've just ingested it. But that's the picture. That's the ordinance of the picture of the Old Testament. But it's not the real thing. And you can always count on a religion to get it all backwards where they think they're eating like a cannibal, the body of Jesus Christ. Now look what he says here in John chapter 6. And brother, this threw his disciples. And I'll tell you what, man. I mean, it, it's like the Lord threw this. I mean, it's like throwing a roadblock. But he, look what he says twice. Verse 35, Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. Now, do you really think he's a loaf of bread? Do you, did you see anybody gnawing on his arms and his fingers and toes? He that cometh to me shall never hunger. He that believeth me shall never thirst. Look at verse 48. He says again, I am the bread of life. Okay? Now, the showbread back there of the Old Testament, in stacks of six and six, picturing 66 books of the Bible, the Word of God. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word, of God, uh, the Word was God, and the Word became flesh. That table of showbread back there is a picture, not only of the Holy Bible, but of the Lord Jesus Christ. But he's not saying, I'm a loaf of bread. But he said, I am the bread of life. Look at verse 56. I can't go through this whole chapter, so... He says, For my flesh is meat indeed, and my, drink, or my blood is drink indeed. Oh, now I'm really confused. Maybe the Catholics are right. But if you go back, if you go back to uh, Exodus chapter 12, when they offered the Passover lamb, they had to eat the sacrifice. By eating it, what are you doing? You're receiving it. He's telling you the same thing. You've got to receive it. You just, can't, you just can't acknowledge it. You just can't know historically that he died on the cross. You've got to receive the sacrifice. And that's what he tells you. Look what he says in verse 63. Because his disciples, man, they're walking out of there, man. They, they're, you know, they've got Roman Catholic roots, you know, Babylonian roots, and they walk out and they're just like, man, I, I can't do this. I can't, I, I can't handle it, you know. But he says, it is the spirit that quickeneth. You're not talking about eating anything. It is the spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit, they are life. And if they would have been paying attention back there with the saw, the pictures and types and the ordinances back there pictured something in the future. But it, it's just, it wasn't the real thing to be eating it. We receive it. If that were the case, I mean, you know, if you think somebody can hocus pocus turn a piece of bread into flesh, he said, this do in remembrance of me. Nothing, nothing magical is happening. There's no magic cookie in there. There's nothing magically happening to that grape juice. It's what it pictures and what it foreshadows or actually what it memorializes is something in the past. That's important. Next thing you know, you'll be trusting in a, in, a, in a wafer to get you to heaven. You're in trouble. To as many as receive him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. You have to receive him. You have to receive the sacrifice. And that's exactly what he's, what he's trying to tell them. Um, it is a memorial to a person and a sacrifice. This do in remembrance of me. Um, I got a verse, I'm going to move on. It pictures the body of Christ in this age. And that's, remember, there's, a, there's a warning in there, and I'm going to read the warning before we have the Lord's Supper. But there's a warning in there where he says, not discerning the Lord's body. And that's for fools that think it's a piece of bread. It's got, it's got nothing to do with it. Do you realize what the Lord's body is in this age? You. You're the Lord's body. We are the body of Christ, spiritually baptized into that body. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body. So all the born-again believers around the world are in that one body. That is what he's talking about, not discerning the Lord's body. Now here's the other thing. What does, what does that bread picture? It's unleavened. What does leaven picture? 
sin and false doctrine. So it's a picture, it's a picture and a type of Jesus Christ. And he says, well, if his body was unleavened, who's the body now? You are. And by not discerning that, you are leavened. And that breaks the picture and the type. And remember, when people break types in the Bible, it's a problem. Moses busted up a type. And he didn't go into the promised land. And here you break a type by not understanding that you too are to be unleavened. No sin, no false doctrine. So Christ was unleavened and so are we to be. And then there's a promise of a future event. Show the Lord's death till he come. You got all that pictured in that this one little thing that we do. We only have two ordinances, but they're both very important. And they state things that, well, they, they state some things that are still, uh, still in the future. And they memorialize things in the past. And we're to take note of that. Now, let me read you 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 to 44. And then uh, when I'm done reading that, you can cut it off and we'll... We'll go ahead with this real quickly. He says, For I received of the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Do you really think it was his body or it was bread? It was bread. He said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Pretty clear. After the same manner also, he took the cup, and when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. I think it's so clear. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. And we are showing not only the Lord's death, but we're also anticipation that he's coming. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Both were unleavened. And that's this, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all righteousness. Nobody is sinless in this congregation. Nobody is without sin, and hopefully we're without false doctrine. But we probably got something wrong. Okay? I mean, it'd be kind of naive to think you got everything right. But hopefully we got all the major things are good. But the point I'm getting at is, we want to appear unleavened like he is. And that, he says, to, and he'll cleanse you from all unrighteousness. So if he'll cleanse you, all we're going to do is have a time of reflection and prayer and, and, and confession. Uh, and then you can partake. Okay, you've got to be honest with God, though. He says, but let a man examine himself. And that's what we'll do here. We'll have a time of prayer, silent prayer. And so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. Okay? It's just examining yourself and say, okay... Worthy or unworthy? Well, what am I guilty of? Lord, forgive me for this. Forgive me for that. He that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. In other words, if you're not going to acknowledge where your, where your sins are before the Lord and you know what they are, now if you don't know what they are and he hasn't revealed them, that's one thing. But if you know what they are and you're not confessing them to him, um... He says, look what he says here. If we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. For when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. You could bring, you could bring some chastening on you. He says, wherefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, tarry one for another. And if any man hunger, let him eat at home. And that ye come not together into condemnation, the rest will I set in order when I come. They had gotten this thing so fouled up in the way they were doing it. There was a supper before the supper. Kind of. And people were bringing food. Now, some people didn't have food, and it was just a mess. And he said, you just come together for this. You eat at home. You come together for this. Okay? Because there wasn't any equity there. there wasn't, it, wasn't, it wasn't fair to others. Anyway, but he says there, there are many which sleep, which are sick and sleep among you. And that is, when you partake of this, you're telling God, I'm all, I'm all fessed up, I'm as right as I can be, and I'm going to partake of this, okay? 
When you don't do that with a, a pure conscience, you can bring some condemnation on yourself, not eternal condemnation. But you can sure bring physical condemnation on you. And that's why it's important. Now, I'm not, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to terrify you. I'm really not. Uh, if, if being sinless today is uh, partaking of that, i got to bow out. Okay, because I'm, I'm certain I've done something today. Even if I don't know what it is, I've done something. Just ask my wife, she'll tell you. Uh, so, so we're going to have the Lord's Supper. Now what we're going to do is we're going to have a time of prayer and self-examination. That is, we're going to have uh, maybe five or ten minutes of prayer. And just pray. You talk to God. You settle everything. Uh, you confess everything you know that uh, is in your life that needs to be cleansed. He says, if you confess it, he'll forgive it, right? Okay. And then we'll partake of the Lord's Supper. So uh, let's have a time of prayer. We're starting right now. Okay. And you can come to the altar if you want. That's up to you.